Live from WRAL News Headquarters in Raleigh, your number one source for local news. WRAL News, coverage you can count on. A man who opened fire on deputies in Wayne County did not appear to be hostile before the deadly shooting. New at noon, what we've learned about the man's criminal background. And we're heating up already. It feels like 102 in Clinton. I'll show you why tomorrow at this time it could feel even hotter. I've needed you far more than you needed me. Remembering iconic Dodgers broadcaster Vin Scully. Fans from coast to coast pay tribute to the Hall of Fame sports announcer. It's another hot day without much hope of cooling off anytime soon. Good, good evening, everyone. I'm Renee Chu. And I'm Jeff Hogan. Elizabeth Gardner is in the WRL Severe Weather Center with a look at that heat index now and why it could get even higher tomorrow, Elizabeth. We're seeing a little bit of a break. When I say a little bit, I mean a very small break in the amount of moisture in the atmosphere today. So that's going to keep most of us with a heat index uh, in the upper 90s. As a matter of fact, right now it's 93 in Durham and Raleigh. And of course, we're here at lunchtime. So that number is going to climb, but probably won't end up reaching the triple digits. However, already in Clinton, it is 102. It's 97 in Fayetteville, 95 in Southern Pines and in Rocky Mount. So there are going to be some areas that do break that triple digit number, um, but it just may not be the triangle. Most of us will break the triple digits for tomorrow. I'll talk about our potential for a heat advisory. This is the way our heat index forecast is likely to go in the triangle area. Uh, right now, we're looking at those mid 90s. And then as we head through the afternoon, it should feel like 95, 96, um, possibly as high as 99. Right now it's officially 89, but our dew point has fallen back to 68. We haven't seen a dew point this low in a while. Now it's a subtle difference between a dew point in say the low 70s versus the upper 60s, but every little bit does count. And the lower that number is, the less likely we are to reach those triple digit heat indices. Here's a look at temperatures right now. Officially it's 85 in South Hill, 89 in Durham and Raleigh, 91 in Fayetteville and 92 in Clinton. Our temperatures, of course, will remain hot all afternoon. We climb into the mid 90s and then finally by seven o'clock, we're back into the 80s. Again, we may see more moisture moving back into the area tomorrow, which would cause our heat index to get higher. I'll show you what it could look like tomorrow coming up. Thanks, Elizabeth. New at noon, the Wayne County Sheriff says there was no reason to believe the man who shot and killed a sheriff's deputy on Monday would be a threat to law enforcement. Investigators say Jordan Hamilton shot three deputies at his home while they were trying to serve involuntary commitment papers. Sergeant Matthew Fishman died and two other deputies were injured. WRL's Keenan Willard is in Goldsboro, where the sheriff spoke to the community for the first time since that incident. Keenan. And it was right here at the Wayne County Courthouse about two hours ago. Larry Pierce speaking to the community for the first time since Monday's tragic fatal shooting. He said hearts are heavy throughout Wayne County today and have been all week. This press conference was the first again that we'd heard from the sheriff since that standoff that lasted nine hours at that home in Dudley. He talked about his fallen officer, saying Sergeant Fishman was an exemplary deputy who was a man of strong faith and leaves behind a wife and two children. We also heard more about the suspect in this case, 23-year-old Jordan Hamilton. The sheriff confirmed that Hamilton had been dealt with multiple times by law enforcement in the past, but didn't go into specifics about what types of calls those were. When asked about the planning for the call to Hamilton's home, Sheriff Pierce said there was no reason to believe he would be hostile to deputies. This is the danger that our men and women face in law enforcement each and every day. I ask for your continued prayers for the families, for our first responders, and for our county. We did some digging into public records and found multiple times that law enforcement was called out specifically on Hamilton. These were repeated incidents over several years. We're going to ask the sheriff's office and get some answers today about how much they took that criminal history into account when they sent deputies to that home on Monday. We'll have those answers for you tonight on the WRL Evening News. Renee? Keenan Willard reporting live in Wayne County. Big news for a local HBCU. A short time ago, Governor Cooper announced that North Carolina A&T would receive millions of dollars in federal funding 
for a workforce program. WR's Brian Schrader explains this driving force behind the initiative. Brian. This is all part of the American Rescue Plan. North Carolina A&T University is getting more than $23 million in federal money to start a new workforce development program, and it's designed to benefit counties in our area. Governor Roy Cooper is joining U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo for this announcement. It just started a little while ago. A&T's winning program is called Steps for Growth, and it's designed to train people to work in clean energy. The program would bring together industry and schools to train people to work in that growing sector. And it's designed to help economically distressed counties in particular. And one of the target areas includes Wilson, Nash, Edgecombe, Northampton, and Halifax counties. North Carolina a and says that Steps for Growth will train and place 5,000 workers in the clean energy sector over four years. Right now, they're helping to plan and implement that program. They hope to have it up and running sometime by 2026. Brian, thank you. Let's take a look at stocks now. A big rally is happening on Wall Street. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up 353 points. S&P 500 advancing 51 points. NASDAQ also a triple digit gained up 258 points. That's after better than expected U.S. economic data calming fears about a recession. In the Life Center right now, we have a big sports announcement from Campbell University today. It's really making the rounds on social media, as you see here. School officials say they are moving conferences, accepting an invitation from the Colonial Athletic Association. Campbell is currently with Big South and will remain with them through the upcoming academic year. This move to the CAA begins in July of next year. Hannah Bazemore, she is the acting director of athletics with Campbell University. She had this quote just a short time ago. It affords athletes and coaches the opportunity to compete among the nation's leaders. A formal announcement is expected soon. Back to you. One person is dead and another has life-threatening injuries after a shooting in Fayetteville. Brett Neese is in the WRL Breaking News tracker with what we know so far from police. The shooting happened here at the Travel Lodge off of I-95 around 3.15 this morning. Investigators have since been focused on the back section of rooms here. Take a look at video from the WRL breaking news tracker of the scene. Fayetteville police tell us one person was shot and killed here while another was shot and taken to the hospital and is in critical condition. I'm working to get an update on that second victim. Police have had this large section of parking lot completely taped off while they collect evidence and try to piece this together. So far, they have not named any suspects. I'll stay on top of the story and keep you updated. In Fayetteville, Brittany, WRL News. A House panel has subpoenaed information from Smith & Wesson after their executive refused to appear for a hearing on firearms after agreeing to do so. The Oversight Committee wants information on the company's AR-15-style firearms sales and marketing. The committee says AR-15s are marketed as a weapon of choice for mass shooters, such as the Fourth of July parade shooting in Highland Park, Illinois, at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas, and a New York grocery store. In about an hour and a half, President Biden is expected to issue an executive order on reproductive care. It will include support for patients who travel out of state for reproductive care. He's due to speak around 2 o'clock alongside Vice President Kamala Harris and several members of his cabinet. WRL plans to stream that live for you on WRL.com and on our news app. We also expect to learn more about the effort to protect abortion access in North Carolina. Attorney General Josh Stein and other officials will address reproductive health care at 2 p.m. as well. WRL will monitor that briefing for you and let you know what comes out of it. It is a sad day for so many baseball fans everywhere. Hall of Fame broadcaster Vin Scully, the radio voice of the Dodgers for nearly seven decades, has died. He was 94 years old. NBC's Miguel Almaguer has a look back at the legendary career. This morning, generations of fans honoring Vin Scully, the legendary Dodgers broadcaster with an unmistakable voice. It's time for Dodger baseball. His poetic play-by-plays, Beloved. There's a 29,000 people in the ballpark and a million butterflies. Bringing the action on the field to life. The one-two pitch on the way, slow curveball. See you later. For decades, his steady, smooth voice narrated many of baseball's greatest hits. Straight away. From Hank Aaron's historic 715th home run in 1974, surpassing Babe Ruth's record. A black man is getting a standing ovation in the Deep South 
for breaking a record of an all-time baseball idol. To one of the most improbable home runs ever, Scully behind the mic as Kirk Gibson emerged from the dugout. Look who's coming up. And went on to clinch a World Series win in 88. She is gone! Born in the Bronx in 1927, Scully fell in love with the game of baseball at a young age. I thought, I'd like to be that fella broadcasting the game. He got his start with the then Brooklyn Dodgers in 1950, calling games featuring the great Jackie Robinson before the franchise moved to Los Angeles. Scully soon moved west too, covering the Dodgers for 67 seasons in all, finally retiring in 2016. I've needed you far more than you needed me. His storied career taking him to the Hall of Fame and all the way to the White House. This morning, fans and players paying tribute to a legend. You can't ever like duplicate a voice like that. He was the best I ever was. The team calling Scully the heartbeat of the Dodgers. This is Vin Scully wishing you a very pleasant good afternoon wherever you may be. Just legendary right there. Vin Scully, 67 years with the L.A. Dodgers. Coming up next at noon, affordable housing in Raleigh. How an open house for locals intends to open up lines of communication for those who need it most. Also, problems plugging in. It's a top deterrent for people considering buying electric vehicles. The logistics of getting those cars charged. Plus, schools in Durham begin classes at the end of the month with or without full staffing. The effort to attract and retain teachers. Download the new WRAL streaming apps on Roku, Fire TV, Apple TV, and Android TV. This episode is brought to you by Direct TV Stream. Direct TV Stream brings you the live TV you love. That means you can stay up to the minute on 24-hour live news, from entertainment to current events, wherever you are in the U.S., whether that's at home, on your TV, or streaming on the go. And you get your favorite live sports, so you can catch this season's biggest games. Get the best of live TV with DirecTV Stream. Get your TV together at directtv.com. Welcome back. You're looking live at Segra Stadium in Fayetteville, where the bases are loaded with heat, humidity, and sunshine. You're watching WRL News, available on Hulu and the WRL app on your TV or streaming device. Affordable housing is top priority for the city of Raleigh. And this weekend, local residents can learn more about housing resources and programs. Joining us to talk about the affordable housing open house is Raleigh's assistant city manager, Evan Raleigh. Evan, so great to have you with us. Let's jump right in here because connecting people with affordable places to live is a top priority for the city. First, what do we mean by affordable housing? Sure. So when we say affordable housing, we're just talking simply about housing that typically is 30 percent, no more than 30 percent of uh, a household's income. So that's the standard measure for affordability. And when we are the city of Raleigh, are really focused on those at the lower ends of those socioeconomic ladders. So folks that may be earning 80 percent of the area median income or 60 percent of the area median income or less than that. So that's really where we're particularly concentrating our efforts. And there are affordable housing units available. You want to connect people with that. Uh, what kind of information can people learn about at this open house to help connect them to that information? So we will have a host of our partners, organizations internal to the city departments, but also partners out in the community that we work with. So folks will have an opportunity to learn about all the wonderful programs that the city offers, down payment assistance, uh, you know, if you are an existing homeowner and maybe have some repairs that are needed to remain in your home, uh, limited repair, homeowner repair, maybe you're facing eviction, uh, we'll have an opportunity to hear about uh, a partnership that we've struck up with Campbell University for an eviction claim. So a whole host of information will be uh, available to folks that attend. So making that dream of home ownership a reality for more people, but then also um, is there help with rental units as well? Yeah, so uh, rental uh, is, is, is a critical need as well. So it, we're not just focused on folks who are 
home buyers, but certainly want to make sure that there's assistance available for folks who are in rental units. Again, you know, speaking to the, the partnership that we've got with Campbell, again, that's largely helping folks that are being evicted from, from rental units, potentially. Uh, so there are resources, whether you're a homeowner, whether you're a renter, prospective homeowner, prospective renter, uh, you'll find that there's information that would be very valuable to have in your hands. A lot of options and resources available. And Evan, this is taking place this Saturday. It's a family-friendly event, right? So bring the kids. Don't need to try and get a sitter. Absolutely. Please come on, come all. We welcome everybody. Kids are certainly welcome. Uh, I will also say you know, we're having it at a beautiful, beautiful park. Uh, so you'll have an opportunity maybe after the event to go out and hang out at the splash pad at Chavis Park if you'd like to hang around. Um, and I'll also tell you that for those that are uh, in attendance, we will be raffling off. Uh, up to five brand new desktop computers, c courtesy of our, our friends with the Camden Institute that we partner with. So not only will you have an opportunity to uh, leave us some valuable information, but you may also have uh, a chance to win a brand new laptop, a desktop as well. Sounds like a win-win there and also a lot of uh, new renovations at John Chavis Park. So get the family out and check out this Raleigh's Affordable house, Open House. It is this Saturday, 9 a.m. until noon at John Chavis Park. That's over on MLK Boulevard. Evan Raleigh, one of the assistant city managers for Raleigh, we thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Talking about another beautiful park here. Want to learn more about the history at Pullen Park? Then you have, to you have a chance to attend a guided walking tour during the month of August. The tours will be approximately one hour long and will start in the circle right by the Welcome Center. The tours are free and for all ages. Whichever park you choose, prehydrate, especially today and tomorrow. Elizabeth Gardner in the WRO Severe Weather Center with that heat again. Absolutely. We're looking at 89 right now. It looks beautiful in downtown Raleigh here. The flag there at the Capitol Building just waving gently in a little bit of a breeze. Lots of sunshine. But, of course, uh, a shady spot would feel good, especially right here under the trees on Fayetteville Street. Our dew point is actually starting to drop fairly significantly. So it may not feel quite as muggy as yesterday. It's going to be maybe a subtle difference. But some of you may notice it. I'm mostly sunny right now and 87 as we take a look from the top of the hill restaurant in Chapel Hill and then we'll head down to Fayetteville. This is a look at Segar Stadium where it is already 91. Now the farther south you go the less of a difference we're going to see. So it's still going to feel pretty sticky. It will feel like triple digits this afternoon in Fayetteville and Clinton. But as you travel a little farther north up toward Raleigh, those dew points, that humidity may be a little bit less than it was yesterday. We have this trough of low pressure which oftentimes would be a boundary for scattered thunderstorms today develop, but we have dry air sitting just above us, and that's going to put a lid or a cap on a lot of thunderstorms developing for today. Right now at RDU, it is 89, and our dew points dropped down to 68. Now, once we get into the 60s, we're, we're talking business, and that means that we'll have less moisture in the atmosphere, and that means that we don't see as high of a heat index. The reason we see a heat index is because our bodies sweat to cool themselves. So you have moisture on your skin, it evaporates into the air, and that evaporative cooling cools us off. Well, if there's lots of moisture in the atmosphere, there's nowhere for that moisture to go. It can't evaporate into an already saturated air mass, so it feels hotter than it really is. So we're, you know, oftentimes this, uh, this time of year looking at a heat index. It is going to climb into the mid-90s for this afternoon. Right now, it is 89 with a heat index of 93 in the Triangle. It feels like 88 in South Hill, but the temperature is 92 in Clinton. It feels like 10 degrees hotter than that because it's a little more humid down to the south. There's more moisture here. It is close closer to a boundary. It's also closer to the coast. So we're going to see increasing moisture again tomorrow. Watch how the green colors start to darken up again over us. This is a look at the amount of moisture that's in the atmosphere. And then this just sticks around. There's Friday, Saturday, Sunday kind of rolling it through. We wish one of these fronts would come through potentially and kick it all out, but that's not likely to happen for the next several weeks. So a nice lower dew point today at 63 will make it feel not as hot. But by tomorrow, we're back into the mid-70s and it's going to feel very steep. Steamy Thursday through Sunday. So look at this 95. It may feel like as hot as 98, but 95 tomorrow may feel like 106. 105 is the criteria for a heat advisory. So tomorrow, even at 95, we could go under a heat advisory. We'll be watching out for that. After that, expect low 100s for the heat index through the weekend. <sighs> hot. So far this year, we've seen 52 days at 90 degrees or hotter. We've blown past the yearly average and the record was 91 set back in 2010. We still have the rest of this month, September, maybe into a little bit of October. So we'll probably add up a lot more, especially since in this seven day forecast, we have nothing but 
degrees. We do have a better chance for some rain as we get into Friday and Saturday. We'll go over the timeline for those days coming up. Elizabeth, thanks. Well, what better way to get out and enjoy the sun than with a picnic? And when you do, you'll want to do it safely. During the pandemic, it was considered healthier to eat outside thanks to social distancing and fresh air. But eating outdoors can be a bit dangerous. Coming up, Consumer Reports and Five on Your Side shares the ways to keep your picnic safe and healthy. Police departments across the state are seizing so many guns, they are running out of space to store them. WRL Durham reporter Sarah Kruger investigates why and what their options are. And electric vehicles are growing in demand, but there's one major drawback for some potential buyers, and it has nothing to do with price. Later, the barrier that drivers see with purchasing EVs. Plus, they're a delicacy in many parts of the world, and edible insects could become more available in the U.S. Why experts say the crunchy crawlers could be the solution to hunger. A big credit reporting agency sent out inaccurate credit scores for millions of people, and Taco Bell is bringing back a popular menu item permanently. Those are among today's business headlines with Maribel Aber. Equifax sent out inaccurate credit scores for millions of people trying to get loans earlier this year. This is according to the Wall Street Journal. It reports the scores were sometimes off by 20 points or more in either direction. The inaccurate information was sent to banks for people applying for mortgages, auto loans, and credit cards. It took place over a three-week period in March and April. Equifax says the technology glitch has since been fixed. Gen Z's thirst for iced coffee helped Starbucks ring up record revenue last quarter. The chain posted $8.2 billion in sales for the period, up 9% from the previous quarter. Cold beverages make up three quarters of Starbucks sales in the U.S. now, and they're especially popular with Gen Z and lucrative for the chain as add-ons like syrup boost the price. And the pre-pandemic routine of a morning stop at Starbucks is back. The chain says morning sales accounted for about half of its revenue. Mexican pizza is coming back to Taco Bell permanently. It will be added to the chain's menu on September 15th. Taco Bell brought back the popular item this past May, but the chain couldn't keep up with demand due to shortages of ingredients. Taco Bell says it has resolved the supply issues now and is ready for Mexican pizza's return. And those are your business headlines. I'm Maribel Aber on The Money Desk. Now we're hungry. One of the single greatest barriers to buying an electric vehicle has more to do with charging stations than cost. A recent survey found that logistics of getting the electric vehicle charged is the top concern among people. More than a third of those folks who were polled said they would buy an EV as their next car purchase. The top objections were charging logistics, the number of miles the vehicle can go per charge, and cost and maintenance. Google may be an indicator that people are anxious to sell their homes. Searches involving the words sell my home fast surged a whopping 2,750 percent within an hour after the Commerce Department released gross domestic product information last week. The report showed negative growth for a second straight quarter. One real estate brokerage firm says it's seen a slowdown in luxury and second home purchases. Another firm says housing has slowed considerably, with home buyers choosing to rent instead. Demand for Airbnb bookings continues to soar even as high gas prices and inflation weigh on consumers in the economy. Airbnb said it had 103 million bookings on its platform during the three months ending in June. Notably, bookings in high-density urban areas increased compared to earlier this year and even exceeded pre-pandemic levels. Thousands of students in our viewing area return to class in a couple of weeks, but one district is dealing with serious vacancies. We'll explain what's being done to fill the openings. First catastrophic flooding, now extreme heat affecting the cleanup in Kentucky. First, here's a look at the winning lottery numbers. Shot in 4K ultra high definition, your number one source for local news. WRAL News, coverage you can count on. 
We're counting down to the new school year. We're inside 26 days until the first day for many students, and we're following three ways schools are getting ready. We'll start with the effort to hire more workers in Durham. WRS Monica Casey is live in Durham with the effort to fill vacancies. Monica? Well, the Durham Public Schools Board of Education is hosting its summer retreat right now. They've been talking about recruitment and retention for more than an hour. As of last count, at the end of July, DPS had more than 360 teacher vacancies. DPS says their greatest competitors right now are not other districts in the area. The issue is teachers leaving the profession entirely. And so that means we have to think about our recruitment efforts differently when we're now competing with research businesses and um, lots of areas in RTP as we have a number of our teachers in particular who are exiting education. DPS says they are working to recruit internationally and create a pipeline for high school students who want to become teachers. They're also targeting key states like New York and Florida to bring their teachers here to North Carolina. And they're working to find new funding sources for recruitment and retention bonuses. Now, another group DPS is trying to recruit is staff for after school programs. Some of those currently have a long wait list. WRAL has covered some of those town halls with parents. DPS saying today they're working with community partners as well as universities to try to staff those programs. Jeff? All sorts of positions, not just teachers right there. Monica Casey live in Durham for us this noon. Thanks, Monica. Students in Wake County Public Schools will no longer have to go to school on Election Day. School leaders voted to close most schools on Election Day in November. The vote comes after parents voiced their safety concerns with outside people coming to campus as schools double as polling locations. Today's vote did not include multi-track year-round schools. And in Cumberland County, families are running out of time to fill out the school bus survey for this upcoming year. To ride the bus on the first day of school, that survey will need to be completed by the end of the day today. The first day for students in Durham, Wake County and Cumberland County schools is August 29th. In the Life Center, an update on President Biden's health, and we have learned that a recent test has shown that he still is positive for COVID-19. Despite that, the president's doctor says he seems to be doing well. He has a cough, but is in good spirits. He has no fever. His vitals look pretty good. His lungs are clear just the same. We are told he will continue to isolate just to be on the safe side. So a lot of the work he'll be doing in the coming days will likely look a lot like this, working through a monitor here. But we have got gotten word that a recent test shows President Biden still positive for COVID at the moment. Back to you. Thanks, Adam. Eastern Kentucky is just beginning the cleanup process after last week's devastating flooding. And Jeff Paul reports extreme heat could affect those efforts. People across Eastern Kentucky face another challenge as they try to clean up after catastrophic flooding. Extreme heat and humidity will impact the region through Thursday night. Forecasters say at times, temperatures could feel like they are in the triple digits. Multiple cooling centers have opened up across the region for those living without power or clean water. I'm, I'm completely homeless now. Hopefully we're going to try to rebuild and try to figure out, you know, yeah. some place to go to. The warm weather comes as search and rescue teams continue to look for anyone still missing. Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir says restored cell service has helped many people reconnect with loved ones. But crews are still trying to reach residents living in hard-hit areas. Some have been cut off after flooding and mudslides damaged roads and bridges. And most of these areas that are flooded do set down in valleys and houses were built, you know, a matter of feet from small creeks, which turned into be raging rivers after the flooding. Communities are now trying to salvage what's left of their homes and businesses. State officials estimate the rebuild could take years and cost millions of dollars. Earl Moore says neighbors will be here for one another no matter how long it takes. Eastern Kentuckians always stick together. We always have. It's like one family in this area. That was Jeff Paul reporting. And school districts in some areas have delayed the start of the school year as officials assess damage to buildings. 
The Great Salt Lake is shrinking and efforts are underway to save it. Utah State House Speaker says it could cost billions to save the lake, but it's money that needs to be spent to prevent more problems in the future. Thousands of square miles of exposed lake bed that are creating real risk for people in Utah in terms of toxic dust. The size of the lake is shortening the ski season and making the mountains have less snow. And the speaker sponsored a bill to fund $40 million for environmental groups to secure water for the Great Salt Lake. And the reason that it's my top priority is it's going to dramatically affect the quality of life of Utahns if we don't fix this. And so we've got to do a lot of things differently over the course of the next decade to change this trajectory. Brad Wilson says more bills and fundings for the Great Salt Lake are expected to be filed when the 2023 Utah State Legislature meets in January. Nearly a year after Hurricane Ida devastated Louisiana, a new initiative is turning restaurants into refuge centers. The New Orleans nonprofit called Feed the Second Line is working to install solar panels that can withstand hurricane force winds and put them on 300 restaurants across the city. They say this will help the businesses keep the lights on and help people in need after a storm. Parts of Louisiana were left without power for 10 days after Ida, which caused $75 billion in damage. So when the whole city's power goes out, that restaurant saves their food. Then they can use that food to feed their neighbors. Uh, they can become a cooling center, give out ice to people. Uh, and that might save somebody's life in the days after a hurricane. So far, just one restaurant has those solar panels, and the owner says it makes her feel more prepared during hurricane season. The nonprofit has crowdfunded the project, but they're hoping to get local or federal funding. A push to normalize breastfeeding even further. Why a respected pediatrician's group decided to issue new guidelines on how long to nurse a baby. And if you ever want to take a trip up into space, the one thing NASA says you must have on board with you. If you see news happening or you'd like to share a story idea with us, just click report it in the WRL News app. Children who grew up in greener neighborhoods have healthier lungs. Researchers monitored more than 3,200 children in Portugal. They used maps and satellite data to circulate and calculate the green areas close to the kids' homes. A team then measured how much air the children could blow out after taking the deepest breath they could. And they found that children who lived closer to greener areas like parks during their first 10 years had better results. More kids have eating disorders than previously thought. 5% of children between 9 and 10 years of age struggle with binge eating and another 2.5% took steps to avoid gaining weight. Boys and girls are just as likely to binge, boys I should say, are just as likely to binge eat as girls. It's World Breastfeeding Week and the American Academy of Pediatrics is issuing new recommendations about how long to breastfeed a child. It now encourages breastfeeding until the child is at least two years old. That's up from the previous recommendation of one year or more. The change was to ensure moms who do choose to breastfeed beyond a year don't feel ashamed, judged or alienated. Health experts say breast milk can help protect babies against ear infections, respiratory infections and various diseases. It can also help the mother by decreasing risk for high blood pressure, heart disease, and breast cancer. The policy really is more of a call to action to everyone, and that includes hospitals. And so we want to make sure that our practices and policies are set up to support moms who choose to breastfeed. Doctors realize that not all moms are able to breastfeed. These parents deserve support as well, since they may feel guilty or even go through a grieving period. Federal regulators are offering an updated timeline for baby formula production as inventory improves. The FDA says formula production needs to continue at high levels for six to eight more weeks to get supply fully back on track with demand. As of late July, about 20 percent of all baby formula products were out of stock. It was only 10 percent before Abbott Nutrition's nationwide recall. Researchers say women are turning to cannabis to relieve symptoms caused by menopause. A recent study involving more than 250 perimenopausal and postmenopausal women found that 86% of those women use cannabis as an adjunct treatment for menopause-related symptoms. Now, cannabis use was found to be more common among perimenopausal women who had worse menopause symptoms, especially stress. 
They may not be the preferred choice for picky eaters, but insects are on their way to becoming the food source of the future. Plus, your chances of living on the moon someday just got a little bit better. What new research reveals about the temperature on the moon? So what's for lunch today? Bet it's not a bowl of crickets. Did you know that eating insects as part of a balanced diet is a critical part of the culture in many other countries around the world? And maybe that could take off here in the U.S. Marianne Rafferty reports biologists say edible insects can provide solutions to hunger and climate change. Insects are going from pests to protein-packed menu items with the potential to combat the world's ongoing hunger and climate crises. They're low in fat and they're high in nutrients, minerals, uh, calcium, uh, so they're good for you. Unlike traditional forms of protein like beef, environmentalists say creepy crawlies like crickets, mealworms, waxworms, and more require less water, food, and space to grow, creating opportunities to reduce deforestation, greenhouse gas emissions, and resource consumption. According to the Worldwide Fund for Nature, quote, 25 percent of global land use, land use change and forestry emissions are driven by beef production. As more of the world's remaining forests are converted into farmland for cattle and fields to grow their food. But in countries like Madagascar, researchers say making room for more cows isn't a sustainable option as they work to increase production of edible insects. This will be our contribution to our fight against malnutrition in Madagascar. Meantime, to help feed the increasing global population, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization says farmers around the world need to increase the size of their harvest by roughly 70 percent by 2050. And while insects can help fill our stomachs, the U.N. says their waste can also be made into low-cost fertilizer for growing crops. That was Mary Ann Rafferty reporting. And while insects won't replace the demand for beef overnight, the value of the insect protein market is expected to go from less than a billion dollars to more than eight billion by the year 2030. People interested in taking private missions to the International Space Station will need to be chaperoned by a former NASA astronaut. A new proposal from the space agency includes numerous requirements. The rules were devised from the lessons that were learned last April during the first mission to the ISS like this. NASA officials say having a legitimate astronaut on board provides proper experience and guidance for the mission. Caves on the moon could make it possible for humans to live there someday. Much of the moon's surface fluctuates from temperatures as high as 260 degrees during the day to as low as 280 degrees below zero at night. For perspective, a day or night on the moon is equivalent to a little over two weeks on Earth. Experts say the moon has pits and caves where temperatures stay at roughly 63 degrees Fahrenheit, making human habitation a possibility. Those pits could also protect humans from elements such as solar radiation, cosmic rays, and micrometeorites. Such, such variation in temperature on the moon for us here. Well, we're kind of sticking with the same theme. Hot and humid out there and temperatures rising, Elizabeth. It is a hot one out there. Temperatures are going to climb into the mid-90s this afternoon. The one thing that we're noticing is that our dew point is really starting to fall. What we're seeing is some drier air that's up above us as we're heating the earth is beginning to mix in with some of the more moist air that's here on the surface. So we're starting to dry out just a little bit. What that means for us is that, yes, it's still going to be hot. We'll hit 95, but it may not feel like much hotter than 95 for whatever that's worth. Tomorrow, though, we could feel more like 104 to 105. We start to see some higher rain chances Thursday into Saturday, especially Saturday. But then by Sunday, a big high pressure system that's sitting out in the Atlantic will back in over us and start to dry us out a little bit. So at least for now, it looks like Sunday could be drier than Saturday. Saturday doesn't look terribly wet. We take a look outside Goldsboro, Apex, Chapel Hill, Durham, Chapel Hill, of course, courtesy of Top of the Hill Restaurant. Uh, it, it looks beautiful out there. It's a little bit of a breeze. We remain on the dry side. Again, we're mixing down some of that drier air that's up above us down here to the surface, making it feel a little more comfortable. It's still 95, so it's not going to feel cool out, but it just may, may not feel quite as sticky as it did yesterday. Our best chance of rain today is going to be down here in our southern counties around Clinton and Fayetteville, down toward the South Carolina line. There could be just a few isolated showers that pop up. We saw some of those across the viewing.
viewing area yesterday. We have that chance again. I, I love this graphic. Widespread would be a bunch of them. Scattered would be kind of moderate. Isolated wouldn't be a whole lot. And then there's way down here can't rule it out. I mean, our chances are, are pretty minimal, 20%. We go up to 30% Thursday and Friday, 40% on Saturday, and then back to 20% on Sunday. We'll take a look at those weekend rain chances. There's a front that tries to move closer to us during the day Friday. That could push some showers and thunderstorms in, especially during the evening, late afternoon. You can see that on Friday. And then on Saturday, we start things out here pretty dry at 5 a.m. Again, with that front in our vicinity back to the north and west, we could see more of that rain trying to slide slide in and the sea breeze front starting to push some rain inland as well. And then by Sunday, we start to see a lot of that uh, ending because of the high pressure system that will build back in. Today and tomorrow, the highs will be in the mid 90s, but a big difference between the two days. Less humidity today, less moisture in the atmosphere means that it'll probably feel like 95 to 97. Now tomorrow, when we start to see more moisture rushing in, it's likely to feel more like 102 to 104 during the afternoon. If it looks enough like we're going to see 106 to 107. The National Weather Service may issue a heat advisory for tomorrow. After that, our highs do back off a little bit. Saturday and Sunday, we're back into the low 90s, which is close to normal for this time of year. And then we may bounce back into the mid 90s again by next Tuesday. We have breaking news just posted to WREL.com. Two teens charged with the murder of a 19-year-old in Durham. They are 19-year-old Nicholas Martin. You can see that young man right here. And a 17-year-old male arrested for first-degree murder. The pair are accused of killing Jeremiah Dixon. He was found shot to death in a car on 15501 North. That was back on June 14th. Police believe Dixon was traveling down the highway when he was shot from another vehicle. At the time, police told us they did not believe it was random. Today, we have learned... They have made two arrests. We'll be back with your top stories right after this break. Today on WRL News at 4, why people who commit crimes on the Las Vegas Strip won't be able to return for one year. The backlash the new rule is promoting from activists. Americans are spending less money on video games. A market research company found that spending on video gaming fell by nearly $2 billion in the second quarter compared to the same time last year. Both Sony and Microsoft posted gaming revenue decreases. All right, remember these two names, Alyssa and Giselle Thompson. The sisters from California made history as the first high school students to sign a multi-year name image likeness deal with Nike. It's a big deal because NIL deals so far have been reserved for college athletes. Now, the topic of NIL deals has been in conversation for the last few years as more states pass laws allowing their athletes to do so and more companies capitalize on newfound opportunities. It wouldn't be possible without the people before us, which we are so grateful and appreciative for like all the women that have came before us and paved this way for, because like, maybe 30 years ago, this would definitely not be happening for women, especially. So it's just insane to me how far we've come. Both are committed to play soccer at Stanford and have worked with university officials to maintain their NCAA eligibility. Our pet of the day was named after the Chronicles of Narnia character, Jill. Jill is one of a litter of five kittens. She's a beautiful tabby looking for her forever home where she can explore, play, and be treated like the princess she truly is. You'll never feel lonely with Jill around because she loves to talk to you all day long. She's spayed, microchipped, and fully vaccinated. To meet this lovely kitty in person, fill out an application on the Cat Angels website. As we wrap things up, here's a look at a few of the headlines we're following for you today. The Wayne County Sheriff says there was no reason to believe the man who shot and killed a sheriff's deputy would be a threat to law enforcement. Sheriff Larry Pierce spoke this morning about what happened Monday. Investigators say Jordan Hamilton shot three deputies at his home while they were trying to serve involuntary commitment papers. Sergeant Matthew Fishman died. Two other deputies were injured. The Durham School Board is creating a plan to hire hundreds of teachers before school begins. The group is on its summer planning retreat, and the group says its biggest competition right now is teachers just leaving the profession entirely. As of last count, at the end of July, DPS has more than 360 teacher vacancies. Within the next hour, President Biden is expected to issue an executive order on reproductive care. It'll include support for patients who travel out of state for that care. He's due to speak at 2 p.m., and you can watch that live on our website and the WRL News app. 
We'll continue to follow those developing headlines and more on WRL News when we return at 4. You can also get breaking news updates anytime with our WRL News app. Oh, have a great day. It looks beautiful up at Lake Gaston right now.